This episode is sponsored by Ground News. Bats, the fury beards of the night. But they are not beards. No, they are mammals in the order Chiroptera. There's a crapload of them, and there's all different sorts, too. About 20% of mammalian species are bats. Look at that, they keep coming, don't they? Now, you don't see them all that often because they're all Heidi Heidi. Not their names. I mean, come on, Heidi's no name for a bat. Bartholomew Banks or Johnny Five Fingers, that's a real bat name. Petunia Featherbottoms, that's another one. The point I'm trying to make is that when the beard figured out how to fly, it stretched out its arm, drew some fancy underarm hair, which turned into feathers, I'm quoting science, and by that time, most of the hand bits sort of got in the way. So most of those bones shrunk, fused, or disappeared. Except for this long one here, which they kept so they could flip us off. Science. Bats, however, went for a different arrangement. They went all in on hands. But, you know how my mother used to say, if you keep playing with yourself, you're going to grow scrotum skin between your fingers. Well, that should give you an idea about what bats have been up to throughout their evolutionary history and its consequences. And it's not just between the fingers, the skin attaches right to the body. And look at this one, it's got a flap back there by the nethers. You know, that has some stank to it. But this isn't just some veiny, floppy, floppy skin. This is a finely tuned instrument of flightedness. Elastin fibers run through the wing the long way, give it some integrity. And there's muscles not attached to bone that run from front to back. With the help of these tiny sensory hairs, these structures allow the bat to adjust the stiffness of the wing membrane during flight. And that's important, because this isn't just some simple up and down flappy flappy business. It's complicated, because each of those fingers can move independently. So they're changing the shape of their wing all the time. On the downstroke, they'll spread those wings out wide, like your mom's umbrella. <laughs> Burn. That gets the lift going, but then they tuck it in a bit on the upstroke so as not to push themselves back downwards like an idiot. Come on, people, they're better than that. But that's just the basics. Look what happens when you ambush them mid-flight with a puff of air, which is apparently something science hippies do when they're bored. They can right themselves with a single contorted wing beat. Quick, Dale, here comes another one, blowing the tube. <laughs> Damn it, Dale, it's still flying. Where'd you learn how to blow, suck school? And that's what it's like to work in a science lab. You've gotta have thick skin like Dale. Anyway, these bats better be good at flying because they're not all that great at walking, or scooching, or whatever you call that. You keep that up, you're gonna chafe your nitzels and your nethers. I mean, there are exceptions. The vampire bat, for example, gets along just fine. It's a good-looking casual stroll, and they can run, too. Now, it's not as suave as the walking, has more of a in-a-hurry-on-crutches vibe. But it works. It looks better than you trying to fly, I'll tell you that. And they don't skip the gym, either. <laughs> Gotta stay in shape. I think this one's more into the elliptical. <laughs> Here we go. Now that's getting your steps in. And if your gym crush walks in, you can always crank it up a notch. Anyway, they're good on their feet because they do a lot of this. Sort of like a very low-key rodeo. And they gotta be able to move to the good spots. Take a little bite and lap up some blood, and that's the only thing they eat. Now, if you think a cow's an easy target, try getting some blood from the foot of a chicken. At least I think that's what's going on. Could be a sort of foot fetish thing, like toe sucking, or maybe an oral pedicure. <laughs> There's a business idea. <laughs> but listen, I don't know this bat, and I don't know this chicken, so who knows? Oop, didn't like that. But it turns out, if all you eat is blood, it's not the most balanced diet. And these little bastards burn through some energy. And if they don't eat for two or three days, they die. So you know what they do? They share. Bonk. If a buddy or someone in the fam missed a meal, a bat that recently ate will regurgitate blood right into their mouths. They're adorable. You wouldn't do that for a friend with your Taco Bell. Bottom line is you gotta eat how you gotta eat. No judgments. You wanna stick your tongue into a flower's sexy parts? Go for it. Just be good at what you do. You might think it's easy sucking on a flower, but it's not. First off, depending on the flower and how heavy you are, you might have to hover. Now, I don't know how much hovering you've done, but it's like treading water, but without the water. By changing the shape and angle of the wing beats, some bats can generate lift on the downstroke and upstroke. It helps to have those back muscles look at them. But even if you can get there and hold still, in some of these flowers, you gotta go deep for the shuggy waters. And for that, some bats have evolved incredible tongues. Sorry, quick aside, that thing on the left looks like a steampunk vulture. Now these tongues can be quite long, but that's just the half of it. Watch this one for a second and see if you can notice something a bit odd. The nectar's going down, but it doesn't retract its tongue. It's not sucking it up either. Instead, it has these two deep grooves along the sides of its tongue. Deep enough so the edges can curl around and form a sort of tube. Muscles lining that tube contract in wave-like patterns, which, with the help of capillary action, forms a kind of conveyor belt for the nectar. Look right around here and you'll see some nectar get pulled up into the mouth. Right there. 
Bats in the genus Glossophagia have a different trick. It's a bit more what you'd expect, a lapping motion. But look at that big-ass drop of nectar that they pull up. The tips of their tongues are lined with a whole feather duster's worth of specialized papillae. But why stop there? As their tongue extends outward, the tip becomes engorged with blood. This causes the papillae to become erect, trapping a whole buttload of nectar through capillary action. Imagine that, having an erection on the tip of your tongue. I mean, you don't have to if you don't want to. Probably best not to search for that either. A lot of people are afraid of bats, and that sort of silliness is in part due to news stories about bats being sensationalized. Recently, a colony of bats was found in a lodge in Grand Teton National Park, and I wanted to see how different news outlets were framing the story. For that, Ground News is excellent. They're a website and app that gathers up the world's news and organizes them by story, along with visual breakdowns of the most important information. You can also see the political bias, credibility, and ownership. Almost 130 news outlets reported on that bat story, and almost all of them chose pretty scary headlines about rabies exposure. Even though none tested positive and less than 1% of bats in the U.S. have rabies and, on average, only three people a year get rabies in the U.S. Ugh. Ground News also has a blind spot feed that shows when stories are being ignored by one side or the other of the political spectrum. For example, when this study linked bat population declines to increased pesticide use and increased infant mortality, right-leaning sources didn't pick it up. It's hard to get the full context of news, and Ground News helps. Head to ground.news slash zayfrank or scan my QR code to save 40% on the same vantage plan I use for unlimited access to all their features. Subscribe today. Where were we? Oh, right. Now, if a bat gets thirsty for some plain old water, it can have a drink on the fly. They slow down a bit so they can have a sip, not a throat full, changing the angle of their wings and increasing wing beats. They don't go to a full-on hover, that's just a waste of energy. But they're able to do this slowed down flying with the help of the ground effect, where the air's interaction with the surface reduces drag and flying becomes more efficient. Now, if they screw it all up and land in the drink, some bats are able to swim. But it's like jumping into a pool with a raincoat on. You're not winning any races, but you can get yourself to the side. Now, on the other hand, if a moth falls into the water and a bat's nearby, it's fu- Oh, guess not. Honest mistake, let's try again. Not that time either. Now, to be fair, this isn't all the bat's fault. It's not drunk. It's just that you're watching the outcome of some evolutionary warfare. Now, you know how bats hunt, and I know you know how bats hunt. But to explain this, it's best to have a refresher. Bats use their vagina. Just kidding. <laughs> That's a vocal cord. What's wrong with you? Like us, bats vibrate their vocal cords to create a wide range of frequencies, most of which are too high for us to hear. Now, there are some fruit bats that echolocate that don't choose their vocal cords and instead click their tongues. But regardless, you know the drill. They make these sounds and then listen for the echo. Many bats will focus the sound in a particular direction, and it's not just by turning their head either. Some adjust the shape of their mouths to broaden or narrow the sound beam that they emit. Others keep their mouths closed and let the sound come out their nostrils. In some cases, the noses of these bats have become very specialized, like satellite dishes. You can see the nose and the ears working together to fine-tune that signal. That tongue-clicking bat can change the direction of its sound without doing anything noticeable, at least from the outside. Now, when those sounds echo back, they have all sorts of information in them. The sooner it comes back, the closer the object. If it arrives first in one ear, you get a sense of the direction. That sound beam will bounce off different parts of an object with slight delays, and those little echoes will interfere with each other in patterns that give the bat an idea of the shape of a thing. The bats can also tell what direction something's moving in. If something's coming closer, the frequency of the echo will shift up. This bat is listening to a recording of pulses that shift up, and it takes off thinking something's closing in. Now, all of this comes in handy if you're trying to track down a flying insect. If they pick one up in the distance, they start focusing their pulses on where they think the insect is headed. As they get closer and move to intercept, the pulses get quicker. Quite honestly, it looks like it'd be a whole lot of fun. Certainly better than waiting in line for a burger. Of course, it's not as easy as all that, and bats spend quite a bit of their time missing. This is a real flight path with a red dot for each time it missed. If you slowed down those pulses, you'd hear sh and then look at that, he just sort of gives up, reevaluating his whole life. <laughs> Should have been a fruit bat. And just when he's at his lowest, a moth flies right into his mouth. And that's not all. He made a drawing that looks just like your dick. 
Now, one of the reasons for all this missing is that some insects got wise to this sonar business. If they stand still on a flat background, they can become sonically invisible from some angles. Apparently not that angle, but there's others, I'm told. Some mothers rub specialized body bits together, creating a barrage of sound that effectively jams the bat's sonar. You know what's worse? Bats do that to each other. Right here, a science hippie captured footage of a bat trying to catch a moth, while off screen, these other bats are basically heckling, like some jackass yelling dingleberry while you're setting up for your golf swing. Anyway, it's no surprise that some bats said, f it, I'll just go fishing. At least that way, oh, for f sakes, he missed that too. But the fish is like, woohoo, I'm flying. <laughs> I mean, bats eat all sorts of things. Frogs, birds, basilisks. And I'll tell you, there's nothing better than having a big meal and then hanging upside down. <laughs> Get to taste everything twice. <laughs> it's not the easiest maneuver, by the way. You fly up and then stall while you flip upside down. I mean, it takes some practice. I mean, this one used his face. <laughs> Once they're up there, they can lock in with those little feet. There's a trick to them so they don't have to use energy to hold on. Each claw is connected to a tendon that has a little bumpy section on it. And that tendon runs through a sheath that has some grippage. When the bat hangs down, it pulls on the tendon and flexes the claw. And those two rough parts come together and hold everything in place. And they can stay that way without passing out, because they have a bunch of one-way valves in their blood vessels. And some of those vessels, especially in the wing, actively pump blood, so it doesn't all pool in the noggin. Now, some bats didn't go with that whole claw setup. Instead, they went for these little pads. The Spix Discwing bat holds onto the sides of tubular plants. It uses those discs like little suction cups. Then there's the sucker-footed bat that doesn't use suction. Come on, science. Instead, it uses fluid, which is used to attach its pad through wet adhesion. This means it can hold on tight when forces are parallel to the surface, like with gravity or some dude. But if you pull at an angle, you can unstick yourself. And listen, we're not even scratching the surface here. We haven't even talked about Reginald Buxley or Sammy the Screw, Minerva Higglesworth, Pugsy Longstank, Henrietta Lollipops, <laughs> Button, Professor Horst Vangerdank, Marvin Featherbottom, Petunia's husband, Ordok, the Destroyer of Worlds. Oh crap, sorry, this one's Ned. This is Ordok, Destroyer of Worlds. You'd be pissed off too if you had matching eyebrow pimples. Those ones hurt. 